Hello again, this is Bog Rips with the second recording session of the Portugal for Noobs Quick Guide tutorial series. So the year is 1454, 10 years after the start date. I have one measly province to show for it after a pretty mediocre war. Kind of a disaster to be honest with you with Morocco. But before I get into that, I want to touch on something that I omitted from my previous recording session. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about DLCs. Uh, I only have three DLCs which are enabled for this series. I have the Rights of Man, I have Common Sense, and I have Art of War. So I do actually own a couple of other DLCs, uh, but this, these three are sold as the Empire Founder Pack bundle on Steam. Uh, if you're new to this game and you want to, you maybe think you're into it enough for some DLCs, but not to get all of them. This is a really good place to start. Uh, I'll try to explain some of the features which uh, these DLCs introduce to the game, but this guide is also gonna apply if you don't have any DLCs. Um, so I don't think I've actually shown anything so far, which is not possible in the vanilla base game. So anyway, I'll get into it. So yes, in the last session we had a war with Morocco and uh, it didn't really go very well. We got trolled really hard by a rebel stack that popped up while we were sieging Tangiers. We retreated into Kuta, could not cross the Strait of Gibraltar, and got stack wiped. So that was our full force limit of 18,000 troops that got stack wiped right there. Uh, and then we tried to let Castile hard carry us through the war. Uh, we managed to uh, get a really good separate piece with Granada giving us over 50 power projection, at least for a little while. Uh, and this one province, Gibraltar, so we control the strait. But uh, I was hoping to take much more land from Morocco, and that definitely did not pan out. But we managed to secure a white piece from them, uh, clutching a mild defeat from the jaws of disaster. So we are left now with 2,000 troops. We have quite a budgetary surplus because we're not paying for anything. Uh, my fleet got damaged. I lost. Oh, it looks like maybe all of my light ships. Now I have two light ships left, which are protecting trade. So it could be better, but it could be worse. I think we're still coming out ahead. We're in a stronger position than we were at the game start. Looks like I have enough admin for a technology. I was probably saving my admin to core provinces, so that's not going to be necessary anymore. So I'm going to take this tech, might as well. So I think what I'm gonna try and do during this session is get a little bit into colonialism, hopefully. Uh, there's some good game mechanics which I'd like to explain to do with colonialism, which is gonna be a focus for a lot of European countries or really any countries you can colonize uh, no matter what you play. And then when my truce ends with Morocco, uh, I'm going to attack them. So truces can be seen in the diplomacy screen under the white flag. Uh, we have a truce with Morocco only until 1458, not very long. Uh, truces are longer if you have a more extreme peace offer. So we took a peace with Granada, which was near 100 war score. And we have a much longer truce. We have until 66 uh, with Granada. So we should actually maybe start getting ready to have round two with Morocco. The only thing is that um, Castile needs to be on my side for that to be a good war deck. And that war didn't go great. Castile actually probably suffered a huge number of manpower losses as a result of fighting on my behalf. So I'll probably puff myself up. 2,000 troops is definitely insufficient for right now. I do have quite a bit of manpower. I'm near the cap. So let me get six more troops. These are regulars. In the prior episode, I accidentally built six mercenaries on one occasion, so that wasted a bit of money. Not, not ideal, but an easy mistake to make. And yeah, we'll get ourselves back up to a respectable army. Um, so another thing that's cool about Castile that I didn't even realize in the last episode is that we start the game with an explorer. And so I think this is a perfect time to talk a little bit about exploration and colonialism. So this is a fleet. I can assign it a leader. This leader is my explorer. You can see that based on a little telescope thing. And now this is going to give me the opportunity to explore the game map beyond what is initially visible. So you can see 
as is kind of what the devs imagined Portugal would know about in real life. We can see Europe, we can see Egypt, and a little bit of, I don't know, the Middle East, I guess you could call it. But I don't really know what's going on just to the south of me in Sub-Saharan Africa. So I can actually send my explorer to explore these sea tiles. Uh, yeah, the game calls this terra incognita, which is, yeah, the Latin phrase that probably would have been uh, used in this time period. Get my troops together. So the game's on pretty fast. This is going to happen quickly. There's different colonization uh, mechanics if you have different DLCs. So if you have a bunch of DLCs, there's a mission down here, and you can make your boats explorer using the mission. Personally, I actually don't like that system. I think it's much better and more intuitive to simply tell my fleet where to go and just allow them to go into the Terra Incognita. Okay, so we're down here. We see some, uh, see some Africa. That's cool. You can see, though, we're starting to take naval attrition. If we're out here at sea for too long, we'll get attrition. So I'm going to send my boats back to repair up. It takes a very long time to explore Terra Incognita. The travel time is maybe doubled or tripled or something to go into an unexplored province. So we're just letting time pass until that truce is up. We'll see if Castile will join us in that war. If not, we might just have to play it safe. Um, what does Castile say? Okay, they're not willing to join another war until 1458. So again, this is something that's different. If you have all the DLCs, the game shows you a pretty complicated decision-making uh, that the AI uses based on trust and favors. Um, so that just makes the game more complicated. I don't necessarily think it makes anything better. Could actually maybe call Castile into this, but they're in debt and it's a far away, so maybe not. Okay, so I just basically have to wait. If you don't have all the DLCs, if you just have these ones, uh, your allies will join a war every 10 years. I think that's a perfectly acceptable system. Perfectly good game mechanic. Uh, so I'll just wait that one out. Still building a spy network, although my spy got caught. That's something that can happen if you have your diplomat building a spy network and they're caught. It'll turn red and they'll be ineffective for a few months. I could bra that, uh, take that diplomat back and have him do something else, but that's a bit more micro than I care to do, honestly. When the time limit is up, he'll just start building that spy network. I want to make a few more claims. Morocco is my big uh, military enemy right now, really the only conquesting that I can do. Okay, my explorer is back. Let's go a little further. Let's see if we can get some Brazil down here. Um, like in many uh, sort of computer applications, you can hold shift to stack commands. So I sent this guy out here. I'm gonna send him to a couple more provinces using shift click. Ooh, it doesn't let me go there. Interesting. Okay. But anyway, I'll send him back to port after he explores that last province, because he's been out for quite a long time. Really, what I just want to do is, yeah, explore a few provinces in the New World. Okay, cool event, tax or money. That's not very much money, so probably, yeah, 50% tax is a lot. It's only for a year, but that's probably gonna be better than 13 ducats. And might as well keep going. My explorer's gonna die at some point. He's already been in my employee for 10 years, so. Interesting, it says I need the idea. Quest for the new world to explore across open ocean. So that's an idea. I didn't actually know that was a, a thing, a game mechanic. It's weird though, because I can go to all these other provinces, so I guess the earth sea tiles, the game must not count them all. So, the game has ways of countries specializing into different things, and that's the idea system. So technologies here are always the same, but you can go down these different uh, ideas in the next tab, uh, which sort of specialize your country into doing something different. So there's a lot of idea groups. It's pretty overwhelming, to be honest, if you're a new player, but um, don't really worry about it too much. Basically, you get ideas at uh, different technology levels. So right now I'm at tech four. When I advance to tech five, which I should do as soon as possible, I'll gain one idea group. So what I'm gonna pick, which is a good pick for Portugal, is the exploration idea group. And you can see here, a quest for the new world is the name of the first idea in the group. So that's what the game was telling me about when it wouldn't let me explore those provinces. Normally, you need that idea group uh, in order to 
recruit an explorer and explorer tiles anyway, so this is usually not an issue. Kind of a, yeah, something I've never seen before in the game, actually. There's all sorts of stuff in this game. Probably why it has so much replay value, why it has such a fan following, is because as, as deep as you want to go with this game, as into it as you want to get, as complex as you want to make it, you can do that with the U4. It's not a, yeah. Oh, this is interesting. Okay, this is worth knowing about. So I have a Rebellion Brewing in Granada. So it's showing up here as a red flag. Probably should have noticed that previously. I'm going to get a couple more troops. There's 7k that are going to rise up. So I want to have that plus two. Actually, I don't think I have any cavalry. I want to have two cavalry right now. Cavalry are good for flanking in the early game. So it's... It can be a good idea to have cavalry in your armies. Okay, that sucks. <laughs> but that was 100% my fault. So basically what happened is I should have had my army there already, but I was too slow, so now I'm going to have to go send my troops over there after the fact. Okay, so my fort was mothballed, like it was not being paid for. I just re uh, reran it, I guess you could say, like turned it back on. So that when this province uh, is occupied by the rebels, I won't suffer penalties. So you can see here, because of the fort in Kuta, this had no further effect on the province. This is one of the values that fort, uh, a fort can give you outside of a war, is that when rebellions fire up, uh, the fort will prevent them from affecting the province. What would have happened otherwise is these separatist rebels add unrest to the province. You can see there is already separatism there in my, uh, plus 13 but it's actually ticking down, so it ticks down by 0.5 per year, which you can see there in the tooltip. These rebels would have added more separatism if it weren't for the fort. So when you conquer new land, uh, even if you don't want the forts in the long term, if you think they're too expensive and you don't need them, oh, this is too bad. Okay, so our rulers have traits. Uh, this is one of the Empire Founder Pack DLCs that does this. We already had expansionists, so we have global settler increase, which means our colonies will grow faster. Uh, we just got a new one. I, th I think we get a new one after being uh, in power for 10 years. So this is going to make our subjects uh, more likely to be rebellious. But when I have subjects, it's still not a good thing. There's some really good traits you can have, so I would rather have a good trait, obviously. Okay, I'm going to bring my troops down and put them in Kuta. Something I didn't show in the last episode, I just used the auto-transport feature. So I can get this army over here using... Oh, they want to walk through Castile. Actually, that's fine. That's better. All right, I'll show you the navy thing after we kick these rebels out and retake the province. Ooh, plot twist. The rebels are running away. Where are they going to go? They're probably going to go into Spanish territory or Castilian territory. Sorry, I'm going to make that mistake a lot. I'm going to call... Uh, Castile, Spain. Okay, so I can have a cheap level 2 advisor, but I think I want prestige. Yeah, my prestige isn't very high. I don't really... I'm not making much money. I don't want a level 2 advisor, especially a diplomatic one. I, I would rather another monarch power. Oh my goodness. Okay, so something kind of funny just happened. The rebels want to go from this province to this province, but any fleet will block the rebels from crossing a strait. So the rebels right now are trying to walk all the way around to get over to my other lands on the other side of the Strait of Gibraltar. And what's funny about that is that uh, every army basically anywhere in the world is going to be hostile to my rebel army and will fight them if they come in the same province. So just like my army got slammed by this rebel army in Tangiers, even though what do I care about the pretenders in Morocco? It's like, but just the way the game works is that the rebels will fight any other army. So <laughs> that rebellion is just going to take care of itself. I can pretty much guarantee you they're going to encounter an army at some point. It's just pretty funny. I like exported my Granadan separatists onto the rest of Europe. Okay, I get pop-ups about other nations. Normally I'm not gonna read these too seriously. The, the Ottomans just had an event that gives them better troops. Okay, I'm gonna slowly keep building up my forces. I don't want to get too low on money in case an event will take some money away from me. 
I'll still have this loan. Let me pay this back. Okay, I'm gonna wait until I have a little more money, then I'm gonna pay back my loan. Then I'm gonna get a little more money on top of that. And then I'm gonna build troops so that I can get ready for another war with Morocco. So yeah, the, I don't have that idea. I don't have idea groups yet, so I can't go into these tiles. Um, might as well do a little country management here. So I'm gonna tell you about uh, province attributes. This is something I kind of skimmed over. So I've, I've popped up these province screens a lot, but I haven't really talked about their contents. So I'm gonna go through the most important province attributes. Uh, the big one is development. So you have three types of development, tax, production, and manpower. So manpower is the easiest, most self-explanatory one. The more manpower development in each province, it's like the population basically, you will get more manpower uh, into your like manpower pool to build armies with. Production, it's a little more complicated. That's like how much stuff is being done, like how strong the economy is, like how sort of industrialized or efficient people are. So here, this is another province uh, attribute, is the trade good is fish. And so there is a base production value of seven, which means actually we're making a lot of fish. Like we're doing a ton of fishing here in Lisboa. Like we have crazy fleets going out and we're just, you know, overfishing the Gulf of Africa. Um, these other provinces have different trade goods. Again, they have production, it's like how much wheat you're making. And then tax just gives you straight up money. So tax and manpower are pretty easy. You can see here, this tooltip will tell you how much value you're getting from that. But the trade good is a bit more complicated. You get money from the production of the goods just straight up in the province view. But then that's what determines the amount of trade value that goes through the trade map mode. So my fish in Sevilla is adding uh, trade value to the Sevilla node, uh, which is then going downstream. And similarly, the production that's happening upstream, like in Morocco, so Moroccan sugar is actually making me money here because it goes into trade value, which then flows downstream. So production is generally kind of better than tax because you earn money on it twice. You earn money on it once directly from the province, and then you earn money on it again when it goes into the trade system, uh, as long as you are making effective use of your trade resources. So anyway, that's pretty much like a really fundamental attribute because these 17 development, if there's other provinces which have low development, like this province only has three. So that's, you know, you'd have to have like a lot of these three development provinces to get as much value as a high development province like Lisboa. And there's some even higher development provinces in the world like Rome, I think. So Rome starts at 28, so it would take, you know, one Rome to equal like 10 bad desert provinces. Um, so there's a map mode for this. You can see the development all over the world. The development map mode is not very good if I'm being honest with you. Like in Lithuania or something, it kind of all looks the same, but you can click on a country, it'll give you a bit of a better view. So here's our development. You can see we have high development in Porto and Lisboa, 17 and 19 respectively, and then lower development in some of these other provinces. So this is a pretty fundamental thing to understand. I probably could have talked about that when I was thinking about my Moroccan war. So this is gonna be relevant when I choose what provinces I'm trying to take away from them. Uh, other things that are really important are the autonomy. So Lisboa is my capital, which means it has zero autonomy pretty much no matter what. And in fact, I think all of my provinces have zero autonomy because um, it's Portuguese, why would they be autonomous? But this new land that I took actually has very high autonomy, 75%. And so as you can see, that gives me 75% less of everything, uh, except for trade power, which I still have 37 and a half, so half of 75%. So if you have high autonomy, you can conquer a lot of land, but if the autonomy in the land is high, it's pretty much like not worth as much as it seems like it would be. So this is part of the reason why I'm actually like not too weak of a country at game start is because even though I don't have a lot of land, my land's like decent, you know, like most of my provinces are above 10, 10 development, which is not bad. And then all of my provinces are the correct, um, they are, have 
low autonomy. And this is another thing that's worth knowing about is they are, all provinces have a culture and a religion. And this is one of the things in U4 that's I think the most fascinating like simulation aspect of it is all over the world uh, through like history, they've kind of designated these provinces with these attributes. So same thing, the culture map mode, you can see we're over here. This is a culture group. Uh, we're Portuguese, pretty cool. Um, something that's worth knowing is that other cultures within my culture group will give us mild penalties, but then cultures in completely other culture groups will give us more severe penalties. So you can see here, the culture group here is Moroccan. It is not an accepted culture, Portuguese is my primary culture. Uh, so you can also accept cultures, that's something I'll explain at a later time. But Andalusian, you can see, is within the uh, Iberian culture group. And so this gives me much lower penalties than the non-accepted culture does. So as I expand, this is something I'm going to have to be aware of. Uh, both religion and culture give you malices. The most important malices most of the time are unrest. That there will be rebellions that pop up in these provinces, just like I had the separatists here. Uh, these, yeah, the separatism appears here, it ticks up. So for this uh, rebellion, there's a 2% chance that it'll tick up every year, or sorry, every month. And then if it gets to 100%, these 8,000 rebels will appear in Kuta. So that's what we just saw happen here. It ticked up fast because the unrest here is quite high. Uh, after the rebellion fires, you can see one of those modifiers is recent uprising minus 100. If it weren't for that, we'd have an unrest of 13, which is uh, extremely high. So I need to do something to get control of these provinces. One of those things that I would like to do is convert them. You can convert the religion of provinces through the religion screen. Uh, however, uh, I don't have enough missionary strength. So these are one of my agents. It's a missionary. I have one missionary. However, Sunni is very resistant to being converted to other religions. Um, and so I cannot convert these provinces at this time, so that's a mechanic that we won't worry about too much for right now. Okay, something I wanted to show you was the use of fleets to move troops. So there's the automatic uh, troop movement system, but you can also put the fleet in a port and put the troops in the same province. You click this button, or the shortcut is A, and I have 10 transports here and 9 troops, they will all load. If you have more troops than transports, like suppose I only had 5,000 transports, then only 5,000 of my troops would be loaded, and the other 4,000 would just sit there. Okay, so that can be used to shuttle troops around. I have military access through Castile, and because I just took the other side of the Strait of Gibraltar, um, I can cross freely, so that's good. Just gonna roll right along, I can now see Brazil. I am now waiting to get my ideas. I want National Ideas 5 so that I can go uh, go colonizing. Okay, another province thing that I kind of touched on last time when I was talking about uh, forts, or castle in this case, uh, is the building tab. So along with the big things which are development, culture, religion, uh, provinces also have buildings in them. Uh, and so you can build a few buildings when you have the right technology. I don't think I have enough technology to build anything. But at, uh, at later times I'll be able to build a church, which gives me tax, so it's an additive modifier to the tax. Buildings can be good, but usually they take about a hundred years to pay off. Like the return on investment is maybe a hundred or so years for most of the buildings you're gonna build. So they can be worth it in the very long run, but not building uh, anything is not exactly, it's not like a rookie mistake, you know what I mean? And newer players shouldn't feel like you have to spend all your money on buildings. So I have a hundred ducats, most of the buildings cost 100 ducats, but I, I wouldn't really feel like I had to spend my money on that right now uh, if I had the technology to do so. I am going to build up a little bit. I want to be closer to my force limit. I'm not going to get all the way there, I don't think. Let's build some troops. Oh, I should have paid my loan first. Oh, well, that's fine. Ooh, this is a nice event. 
I can get a stability. That's definitely worth it. So, uh, Papal Influence, you get, like, uh, points for being Catholic and for having a lot of, uh, Catholic representation in the, uh, like, I don't know, Catholic, Roman Catholic Church. So you can see that in the Papacy tab. You gain Papal Influence. Uh, I have seven. I don't make a ton of Papal Influence because, uh... I'm not a very populous country. You can see the uh, number of cardinals each country has. I think I probably have one. I don't, maybe I only have zero. Ooh, does it even say, where the hell am I? Okay, weird, I don't see my flag in this tab. It'll probably tell me in the religion view, whatever. I probably have a few cardinals. You get points, papal influence points for having cardinals. And you can spend those points on these bonuses. So you can get uh, tax, you get legitimacy, interest per annum, so this makes loans cheaper, diplomatic reputation, mercantilism, manpower recovery, or stability. So you can he see here, stability, one stab costs 100 papal influence through this system. And I just had a choice to either gain 20 papal influence or gain one stab. So basically the same trade-off, so definitely worth it uh, to take that stability over the 20 papal power. So something I'm going to do here, this is a pro-gamer move, I'm going to send one of my diplomats to improve relations with the Pope. Because if the Pope and me have good relations, I will gain more papal influence, and then I'll get to have more stuff. The other thing you can do is you can spend these points on a chance to become the Pope. So this is, you know, this is really how the Catholic Church kind of works, and kind of worked at this uh, point in history, so... This might seem like a dumb, overwhelming, stupid, confusing mechanic, but it's really cool, to be honest with you, that this is, like, simulated. So you can use your Papal Influence to have a percent chance of your Cardinal from your nation becoming the Pope. So right now, the, car the Pope used to be a Cardinal from the Papal State. Uh, and I think that's how the game starts, it's only been, like, 14 years. But when this Pope dies, each of these countries here is going to have a percent chance of being the new pope. So the Palatinate, Castile, France, and Hungary all have a little chance. Oh, sorry, not Hungary, just France. They have a chance of being the new pope. Now, if you become the papal controller, you can you get a bunch of benefits and you can do some useful things. If you're a new player, it's kind of worth maybe investing some points in. You can get some good stuff out of it. Uh, but it's not a huge priority. And I think most of the time, especially if you're a newer player, it's better just to save up your 50 papal influence to get um, like some extra money or something, whatever you need. Extra money, extra manpower. So yeah, I'm just waiting out this truce. Oh look, I have a huge spy network now. That's why I didn't want to micro it, is because I knew I'd just like forget about it. I actually did that in the prior episode. I said I was going to take a mission, but then I didn't, so anyway, hopefully I'll get the chance to do that in this episode. So I'm gonna fabricate whatever, anything that I border. Is this a good province? It's an okay province. This is in my trade node, yes. I can see in the uh, trade map, it's in my trade node. I'm gonna try and conquer mostly in my trade node. It tends to be a good idea to uh, conquer trade node by trade node if you're like money motivated.